church, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the 13th chapter of Luke? Luke chapter 13. And just hold that there. I want to give you a little bit of context for what is coming in the first uh, six, seven verses of this chapter. Okay, Luke chapter 12, actually the 59 verses that we have there, set the tone for the six or seven verses in the 13th chapter. There's a long interaction between Jesus and his disciples. And we see that Jesus kind of urges his disciples to acknowledge who he is. And we see that in verses 8 to 12. And then we see that he invites them to be responsible stewards in 13 to 21. And then to live in trusting God for provisions, to, to acknowledge that God is the giver of all good things in 22 to 34, and then to be ready, to be ready for the second coming that will happen and to be found faithful during the time that they are waiting. And, gen and then to endure all the different social disruptions that may happen as we get to that second coming of his. So the whole of the 12th chapter is telling the disciples Look, this is what's going to happen. This is how you need to live. You need to live depending on God, but you need to be found faithful, and you need to be ready when the second coming happens, when the end of the age happens, that it will come suddenly upon you. You will not have time to uh, prepare at that moment, that it will dawn upon you like that. So there's a lot of preparation that he's giving to his disciples. And then we come to chapter 13, and it says, about this time, that is after Jesus had said all these things, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all, and you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told the story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there were any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Kind of a somber passage, isn't it? It's uh, not one that talks about great joy and peace and all those wonderful attributes that sometimes we, we like to hear. Here Jesus very clearly, in the first six verses itself, he says, you will perish too unless you repent. Twice in six verses, he repeats this. You too will perish if you do not repent. Now, as we look at this passage, we see that the people are talking about something that has happened in the temple to Galileans who were there giving sacrifices and then Herod had them killed. And there are sordid tales that are attached to this of uh, all kinds of things that uh, their blood was mixed along with it and defiled all that was going on. And those are just stories that, rabbinical stories that have come down about how terrible a person Herod 
was. But the fact remains that when you kill people who are worshipping, that is it's in itself a horrific thing. And that's what happened to these Galileans, that as they were offering sacrifices at the temple, Pilate, I'm sorry, Pilate had, had them killed. Now, Jesus asks a question, but he's actually asking that question because of an assumption that is underlying in this text. And that assumption is this. Did they suffer like this because of their sin? Did they suffer because of their sin? So people were looking at those Galileans who died and said, yeah, they were sinners. They must have done something terrible. That's why this happened to them. And so Jesus kind of, as he is wont to do all the way through his earthly ministry, he knows what the people are thinking. And he addresses that thought immediately by asking this question, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people? And then very emphatically, he says, no, not at all. Is that why they suffered? Not at all, he says. So he answers that question, that it was a sad thing that happened. They were brutally murdered, but it had nothing to do with the fact that they were sinners or sinned more or lesser than any of the other people. Because the Jews always connected sin and suffering, isn't it? Right through the Old Testament, we can see. Remember Job, hearing from his friend Eliphaz, who came and sat down there, and then in Job 4, 7, and 8, he says to Job, Stop and think. Do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. That's the, the same thought that is inherent here. And then we see it in Deuteronomy 28, 20 also. Isn't it? The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done in forsaking him. And so the, the Pharisees especially, and the Sadducees as well, looked at the successes and the wealth and good health that they had as blessings from God. And conversely, the poverty and disease and sickness and blindness and all of that as sinful, that it, it was a consequence of sin. And Jesus takes these two kind of calamities, the instance of this kind of killing uh, by, of the Galileans and this random incident in Siloam where the tower fell on 18 people. Both saw people snuffed out with little warning and no clear apparent reason. But here's the thing. Both those events showed just how fickle life is. Both those events show just how fickle life is. None of those people who were in the temple giving sacrifices ever thought that they would be killed. All the people on whom the walls of Siloam fell on. Death came suddenly. They couldn't prepare for it. It was upon them and it overcame them. And that's the, one of the subtexts in this passage that we need to understand, that life is very, very fragile. Life is very, very fragile. That none of us can know that we can have our next breath. And how we have seen in these last two years also, isn't it, that so many have died. And we never thought that we would lose people. And yet we have lost ones who are family members, close family, friends, gone just like that. And so one of the things we can take away from this passage is the suddenness of death and the unpredictability of life. And Jesus 
is pointing out that death can come as suddenly to anybody. And therefore, he says, repent. Therefore, he says, repent. Be careful of the life you are living. Because you may think that I'm in good health and I have plenty of time to get my act together. And you may not have the next second. And there's an urgency to what Jesus is trying to speak here. When you look, read through the 12th chapter and you see all that he is trying to cram in and tell his disciples, these are the important things before the second coming that you need to be aware of. Be ready, be faithful, be found faithful. Don't just live your life thinking that you've got a pass on the next uh, hour or the next day or the next year. You don't. The thing is, repentance is key if we have to think about the unpredictability of death. The question is, do, have we repented of all that we have done? Twice, he says, and you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. Verse 5, no, and I will tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. You know, we read this and then there's, in a sense, we almost kind of move away from here and say, yeah, it really doesn't have to do with me. I'm okay, isn't it? I've accepted Jesus. The Bible says if you accept Jesus. And there's this little bit of a sense of complacency that settles into our lives that say, I'm okay. I have my boarding pass, and when that flight is announced, I'll get on. But then Jesus goes on to say, then Jesus told the story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there were any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs the next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. And it seems like Jesus in these verses seems to be preempting the questions and the kind of the positions that we are taking. Even as he looks at the first six verses and, and addresses that assumption and says, it's not about that, it's about you. Have you repented? In the next, in the short parable about the fig, there's a talk of imminent judgment. And the judgment is on a tree that is growing. It's growing. There's no problem. It's not that it's a dead tree or anything. It's just growing. But it's not bearing fruit. It's not bearing fruit. And the gardener says, the owner says, cut it down. It's just taking up space. And then the gardener says, give it one more year, sir. Give it another chance. I'll do something. I'll add fertilizers and stuff like that. If after, at the end of one year, if it doesn't, then you can cut it down. And the point that Jesus is making here is that merely existing, going through life, is not enough. That there must be fruit that comes from your life and mine. 
there must be fruit that comes from your life and mine. And fruit bearing, as we look through Luke, is such an important theme. John the Baptist's teaching in Luke 3, 7 onwards, describes just interpersonal dealings as the fruit of repentance. In the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6, 43 to 45, Jesus states that a good tree produces good fruit, and similarly, a good person produces good from the goodness of their heart. In the parable of the sower in Luke 8, Jesus explains that those with, with good hearts hear the word of God, hold fast to it, and patiently produce fruit. Right through. Just existing. Doesn't cut it. The criteria here is, is there fruit? John the Baptist said, bear fruits worthy of repentance. When you talk about repentance, repentance must be such that you can look back and say, here's when I repented, and look at the fruit in my life because of that repentance. It kind of pulls the rug out of any complacent thinking that we may have that, my goodness, I'm fine, I'm just going through, the, going through life. And then sometimes what we do is we, we put ornaments on the trees, isn't it? Like a Christmas tree, we decorate our lives with, with things that look nice. And yet fruit come from within because of a healthy tree, beloved. The things that you do in your life, the things that people see, must come from the relationship that we have as disciples of Jesus. That is fruit. Everything else is just an ornament and has absolutely no value in the kingdom of God. And so we need to be careful about the things that we just plant upon our lives so that it looks good, but they have nothing to do with the branches, with the roots in our lives. And Jesus is saying repentance must, must produce fruit. That's why these two passages, seemingly different, are put together. On the one hand, make sure that you have repented for the things that, you're, that you've done. Repent. And we've looked at repentance, isn't it, on our Wednesday meetings. And we said that repentance has five stages, as it were. That the first stage is to feel remorse for what one has done. To feel remorse, as we, we saw in Lamentations. See, O Lord, for I am in distress. My spirit is greatly troubled. My heart is overturned within me, for I have been very rebellious. That's remorse. To acknowledge exactly what you have done and who you have been in that sinful existence. My spirit is greatly troubled. I'm in distress. My heart is overturned within me, for I have been rebellious. That's the start when we have remorse like that for the things that we have done. Not just platitudes, Lord, I'm so sorry I did this. And then to turn away from that thing or that thought or that deed or that thought. That's the second. As we looked at the prodigal son, the point where he came to his senses and he said, I will arise. I'm done. I will arise, acknowledging that where he was, was not where he should be. And then thirdly, turn away from that thing, and then thirdly, turn to God. Turn to God. I will arise and go to my Father. I will arise and go to my Father. Sometimes our repentance is just, Lord, I'm sorry I did this, and then we carry on with life, isn't it? Just doing what we want to do. 
instead of going to God, clinging to him and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I'm coming back to you. Somehow restore me, regenerate me, invigorate me, give me your path, give me, show me my future. Help me to overcome these things that I used to. All of this, we turn to God. Then confess that sin before him. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in thy sight. Confess it. Bring it out and say, Lord, here it is. This is what I've done. This is what I've done, Lord. And it's against you. The collateral damage is possibly our families, our friends, our colleagues, all who suffer because of what we have done. But primarily, the sin is against a holy God. Against you. You only have I sinned. David echoes that in Psalm 51 as well. Against you, you only have I sinned. And then finally, having confessed, we receive his forgiveness. We receive his forgiveness. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All of that is captured in that word repentance beloved and Jesus is saying listen be very careful of what your assumptions are repentance is key and then there must be fruit that the repentance was real there must be fruit that the repentance was real I want to just add this as I kind of close, bring this in closing. You know, the Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. That's true, Hebrews. The judgment from God will come upon us once we have died. This period that we are living in is the period of grace that the gardener said, wait, give me a year. Give me a year to try and do what I can to change this tree and produce fruit. Give me this time. And that's the time we live in. But I started by saying it, this is a somber passage and it is somber because of this. Because you and I don't know how long the period of grace is. We don't. Many times we have been told that nobody knows the hour. It will come stealthily. So we don't know that. Secondly, none of us know whether we will have a tomorrow to repent. We don't. And that's how grave and important this passage is for us. To ask ourselves, have we truly repented of all that we have done? And yes, there there will be suffering in this world, and I need to address that as well. That when we are sinful, there are consequences, but that is not judgment. It's the consequences of living a sinful life. And so if you go out and commit murder, you have gone against God's law, but you end up in jail, And that's the consequence of what you have done. The judgment for that will come when you stand before the throne of God. Are you with me? And there are consequences, beloved, for our sin, for the way we live our lives. And so 
There may be hardship and sorrow and suffering and death even that is caused by you or people around you. And you're going through it. You're going through that suffering. But it's a consequence of someone else's sin. Look at David. Right? His sin with Bathsheba affected the integrity that he had with his commanders. Joab looking at him and saying, what kind of a decision is this? Affected Uriah. Affected Bathsheba. Affected the child that they had. All the consequences of David's sin. You see the woman who was caught in adultery. Why was she brought to the feet of Jesus? That is a consequence of the lifestyle that she was living. But he refused to judge her. But the consequence of her sin was being dragged down the streets in whatever naked attire that she had, trying to cover up her nakedness to the feet of Jesus. The consequence of living that lifestyle that she allowed them to do that to her. There are consequences in this life, beloved. And they may be that you're going through a difficult time because of somebody else. Don't ever kid yourself that Sin only affects you. That's the worst lie from the pit of hell itself. It always, it infects and it affects people. I hear this so much about pornography. It's just between me and what I do. No, it isn't. It has tremendous ramifications. For you in married life or for you youngsters who are getting ready to be married, it has ramifications. Sin infects the person and affects people around. But there's a judgment that is waiting that will be determined by whether we have repented of what we have done. And for that, we need to be very, very careful. A, to have repented, and B, to make sure that there is fruit that is consistent with that repentance. That is our word, beloved, today. To search our hearts, and we have said that that's what we're going to be doing through these days of spiritual renewal that we are in to open our hearts and allow the spirit of god to search us and i think today we need to say let lord take luke 13 and use it as a as a grid against my own life and see how i i stack up against it lord what do i need to do today whether it, i need to be repentant to be able to deal with sin sin that is lying in my life or whether I really need to search and see is there fruit from my, am I living the kind of life that God wants me to live that produces fruit or have I placed Christmas ornaments all around and, and think that I'm fine I think every now and then as we look through scripture while there are passages that lift our spirits, inspire us there are also passages that say, be careful as well, that our God is a holy God. A God who has said that he treats sin very seriously. So seriously did he treat sin that he sent Jesus. That's serious. That he sent Jesus to die. For us. He's given us that beautiful way. We need to make sure, beloved, that we don't scorn it. One more year, the gardener asked. I don't know what that means for you, for me. How much time we have. But the word of God says, you don't know. You don't know that. And so while it is today, call out to him. While it is today, while you have breath, even now, in these moments as the worship team comes up to lead us 
in our closing song and you're saying, Lord, I've heard your voice. There are things in my life that I need to deal with. Do what you need to do, beloved, to deal with it. Because the word for us today is repent and bear fruit. Repent and bear fruit. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just open ourselves to you, Lord. We say, Lord, you search us, you mine us deeply and see if there be any wicked way in us. Oh, Lord, keep pride away from us at this moment or ego or anything like that. Lord, if there's something that we need to repent, help us, Lord, to, to do that right now. To be able to say to you, I will arise and I will go to my Father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I will arise. Help us to do that, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.